morning session today. The first speaker is Professor Satyadev from Harishchandra Research Institute, and he will speak on on the colored topological theorem here. Professor Satyadev. Okay, thank you, Professor Shalabulkar. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so let me share my screen first of all, then I start the lecture. Okay, so uh, the my slides are visible to everybody? Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, today I will be talking about the, actually there is a very good theorem, it's called Torberg theorem, and that is basically in convexity theory, uh, dealing with some combinatorics, and uh, uh, that was actually a very good theorem, uh, but later on its topological version became very interesting. And uh, the topological version of the Torberg theorem is still being investigated, Many people are working in that area. There are so many problems. Uh, but in this talk, today's talk, I'm going to talk about the color version of the topological Torberg theorem. So, <clears throat> let me give you a simple motivation and then I start my talk. Uh, suppose we have six points in a plane and which are in general position. That means no three points lie in a straight line. And the question is, can we decompose those six points into two triplets so that the intersection of their convex hulls is non empty? And answer is very easy because you see, just look at this example. You see in the first picture, you have six points and they are all in general position. Now you can decompose them into triplets. Uh, for example, in the second diagram, you have two triplets and uh, then think of their convex hulls, they are triangles, but they don't intersect. Similarly, in the third diagram, you have two triplets, they don't intersect, but the fourth one, they intersect. In the fifth one, also they intersect. In the sixth one, they also intersect. So given six points, it's very easy to see that you can always decompose them into two triplets so that the intersection of their convex hulls is not empty. And, uh, now let us take, say 12 points. So these are 12 points in general position at the same question, because you have 12 points, can you decompose them into four triplets so that the intersection of their convex hulls is non empty? And in the second diagram, you can see that yes, this is possible. And this is how you can decompose them. And the intersection of the, all, all the convex hulls has actually a common part, much bigger, but that single blue point, I'm indicating that this is the uh, intersection part. So given 12 points, you can do that. Similarly, <clears throat> given uh, now I'm taking the multiple of three uh, points. So you have 12 points, you have 15 points, you have 18 points and so on. So in general, In general, so here is the question that <clears throat> given any three R points in plane, three R points, R can be arbitrary. That means multiples of three. Can you decompose them into R triplets so that the convex hulls, their convex hulls will have a non empty intersection? And actually this, this was a theorem which was proved uh, by Brian Birch in the year 1959, a small paper and it was published in the Mathematical Proceedings of Cambridge Philosophical Society. The title of the paper was on three and points in the plane. Proof is not easy. It uses some theorems of combinatorics as well as some uh, uh, real analysis, density theorems and so on, but it's a very interesting proof. And he, he proved it and the paper was a very, it was actually, it attracted many people to think about, uh, read this paper and then think about uh, further works in this direction. And uh, then uh, sorry. 
Yes. So this was this was the theorem of Brian Bilge, and uh, now in the same paper he made a remark, and that remark is really wonderful. He said that he the result is also true for a set of uh, three r minus one points, not necessarily three r points, but three r minus one points. And in fact, he said that even the result is true for three r minus two points. What does it mean? This simply means that if you take three r minus two points in the plane, which are in general position, you can decompose them again into r parts. Now they won't be triplets now because you have three r minus two points. So there will be some triplets. There will be some uh, pairs, and then there will be also some points. So given three r minus two points, you can decompose them into r parts such that the intersection of their convex hulls is non empty. This was the remark that he made, and he said that the same proof which I have given that applies, and one can easily modify and see that this result is true. And actually, you'll be surprised to know that this is really, this is called the sharp form of the Birch's theorem, that instead of three R points, we take three R minus two points. And uh, it became really the most important thing. Now, the number of points cannot be reduced further. Actually, it is possible to give an example of three R minus three points located in the plane, so that it is not possible to partition them into R parts, so that the intersection of the convex hulls will be non-empty. Hence, to be exact, we could replace the number three R by three R minus two in the Birch's theorem. Now, then something interesting happens. For example, I said if you take twelve points, you can decompose them into four triangles. But if you take uh, ten points, that means two less than that. So you see here, there are ten points. And I have here the first figure shows that the 10 points, they can be decomposed into four parts and the intersection is not empty. Naturally, you have three triangles and a point that accounts the 10 points. And that point lies in, in the intersection of all, all those three points, three triangles. There is another way of doing the same thing. You take look at the second diagram. Again, here you have 10 points and I have, we have decomposed them into uh, four parts. The four parts, they consist of two triangles and two line segments. And as you can see, the intersection of, the, of their convex hulls is not empty. The blue point is in the inter intersection. So these are examples to show that 3R minus 2 uh, version is really uh, the most appropriate one. Then he made a natural conjecture. Now, see, this is the plain case he decided. And it was a wonderful theorem and uh, uh, very interesting. But then he thought that, uh, what about the uh, in higher dimensions? In other words, in the plane, we took three R minus two points and we decomposed into R parts so that the intersection of their convex hulls is not empty. Now, if you consider R3, then the number of points, uh, he said that take four R minus three points now. Can we still decompose them into R disjoint subsets so that the convex, their convex hulls will have a non-empty intersection? More generally, he, he actually asked this question. Actually, he made a conjecture that take instead of R3 or R4, for example, R3, you take four R minus three points. In R4, you will take five R minus four points and so on. So the general conjecture, he made this. Given any D plus one times R minus D number of points in the space R to the D. Now notice, in the R to the D, uh, the number of points that we are taking is D plus one times R minus D. So given any D plus one times R minus D number of points in the space R to the D, there exists a partition of that set into R uh, subsets whose convex will have a non-empty intersection. This uh, he made, he actually made a conjecture. He could not prove this. Of course, he tried. Brian Birch, of course, is a great mathematician, as you know. One of the Millennium Prize problems has his name. So this problem remained uh, unsolved for quite some time. Then finally, a Hungarian mathematician called Torberg, he proved this conjecture. And uh, the paper, the title of the paper was a generalized Radon's theorem. Actually, he looked this as a special case of uh, a general case of uh, Radon's theorem, which is also a similar a theorem of similar nature. He published in the Journal of London Mathematical Society, and the, it was published in the year 1966. And the theorem was so interesting that it became famous as T66 theorem. 
anyway, so uh, this was a great result proved by Torberg. And uh, in the proof, actually, uh, there is not much except the uh, very technical part of uh, linear algebra and some convexity theory and uh, some theorems about the general position. So now you see uh, the Torberg theorem I can state as follows. <clears throat> so uh, now I want this to be clearly understood. I take the dimension D to be greater than or equal to one. That means even for real line, you can make a Torberg theorem. And you take R to be greater than or equal to two. And now think of this number N. And this is the crucial number. Number N is simply D plus one times R minus one. And you remember D is the dimension of R to the D. So think of this N as D plus one times R minus one. And therefore you compute that N plus one will be simply D plus one times R minus D, N plus one. And now you see that D plus one times R minus D, this is the number which appears in the conjecture of uh, Brand Birch that if you consider uh, D plus one times R minus D number of points in R to the D, then can you decompose them into R parts? So now uh, I, we will consider the N plus one points where N is that number, D plus one times R minus one. And the Torberg theorem now we can state as follows. Any set with N plus one points in the Euclidean space R to the D can be decomposed into R disjoint subsets F1, F2, FR, so that the intersection of their convex hulls is going to be non-empty. Now, deliberately, this n plus one has been chosen because you see, if you think of this number n and think of a n simplex, then the number of vertices in that simplex will be n plus one. And that's why this n has been chosen like that. So this theorem is true for any d and any r. The case when d is equal to two, this was proved, of course, by Birch in 1959. And the high dimensional case in R to the D, the above theorem was uh, conjectured by Birch and it was proved by Thorberg in 1966. Now, here is another version of the same theorem and this is going to be very interesting because this will uh, le uh, take us from, uh, from the convexity theory or from uh, uh, linear spaces to topological spaces. So here is the, the, the same result I can uh, state as follows. See, the Thorberg theorem, can be stated in this form. Namely, let delta n denote the n simplex and consider a map f from delta n to the r to the d, which is linear. Then the theorem says, Thorberg theorem says, then we can find r disjoint faces, sigma one, sigma two, sigma r of delta to the n, such that the intersection of their f images in r to the d is going to be non-empty. This is exactly the Torvald theorem. And it's very clear why. Because you see, <clears throat> in R to the D, we know the Torvald theorem is true. So if you have delta N, then take uh, those, uh, uh, the, consider the vertices of delta N, their number is N plus one. And therefore their number is the same thing as D plus one times R minus D. And uh, you can set up a one-to-one -one correspondence from the vertices of delta N to those points D plus one times R minus D in R to the D. And this one-to-one -one correspondence can be extended to a linear map. And now in the right-hand side, you know that the Torberg theorem holds. So just, uh, that means there are the uh, sets F1, F2, FR, uh, whose uh, convex hulls will have a non empty intersection. So pull back all those F1, F2, FR, you get really disjoint faces of delta. And therefore, you find now that the F images of those disjoint faces of delta N, that is going to be not empty because of the Torberg theorem. So you can state the Torberg theorem in this form. And I'm repeating this because <clears throat> uh, I'm going to now um, generalize this. So the Torberg theorem, you can state in this form that uh, take N simplex delta N, take any linear map F from delta N to the R to the D, then the theorem says that you can find out are disjoint faces of this simplicial simplex of delta n such that the intersection of their f images is going to be non empty. This is the Torberg theorem in this uh, linear form, in the map form. And now <clears throat> the question is this instead of linear map, now you take a continuous map. 
So the same question now arises that given a continuous map f from delta n to the r to the d, can you still prove that there are r disjoint faces of delta n so that the intersection of their f images in r to the d is going to be non-empty? So replace linear map by continuous map and uh, ask the question that, is it still true that the, we can say that the Torberg theorem is true in the case of continuous maps? This question was asked. And now naturally, as you know, because linearity is gone and topology has come, continuous maps have come, things can be very bad now because a continuous map can take a face to a very complicated uh, uh, part of the R to the D. So this question was asked. And uh, it's really interesting that the first attack on this question was done. This question was first answered by Barani. Barani is a very good combinatorial man, combinatorial person. Barani, Schlossman, and Zooks in the year 1981, they answered this question. They proved that the answer to the above question is informative provided the number R is prime. Now remember that R, where, where is R? D plus one times r minus d so that r is that number so if this number is prime they prove this result that the question is affirmative even for continuous maps now in order to prove this result of course they used the famous bursu coulomb theorem for gp actions and uh, there was another mathematician ozayadin he proved it when r is a prime power and of course only uh, some uh, technical tools have to be uh, more uh, used in order to prove the prime power result. But the basic result was prime result, and then prime power result was also proved. Therefore, the topological version of the Torberg theorem was proved when R is a prime power. And these results, they became known as topological Torberg theorem. The general question for arbitrary R remained as one of the most challenging problems of topological combinatorics. And this was really a very difficult problem. In other words, if R is a prime power, we have proved the uh, topological Torberg theorem. Now, if R is not a prime power, what can we say? And uh, it was very interesting that after so many years, in February 2015, Florian Frick, he gave an example to show that the answer to the above question when R is not a power of prime is in negative. That means the Torberg theorem, topological Torberg theorem is not true if R is not a power of prime. Actually, he produced an example of a continuous map F from delta N to the R to the D, where R and D are suitably chosen, such that whenever we take any family, sigma one, sigma two, sigma R of R disjoint faces of delta N, then the intersection of their convex hulls is empty. That example he produced, and it was a very interesting example. So this is the topological Torberg theorem, story of topological Torberg theorem. So and, what, uh, was the what was the prime factorization of R? Uh, prime factorization of R? It was a prime power. R was itself is a prime power. No, no. You said prime. Oh, R is still a prime power. Yeah, if R is a, a prime power, then the theorem is true. Topological Torberg theorem is true. Yeah, but otherwise, counterexample? Uh, yeah, the counterexample was that if R is, uh, take any R which is not a prime power, then he so produced who, an example. That no, you, you said R and D are suitably chosen. Yes, there, there is a particular good choice so that the result actually works. The counterexample no, no. So, works. So can you, can you choose any, any R which is not a prime power? Yes, yes, yes. That, that you can do. That's what he proved. Hmm. It was a wonderful result. Of course, the choice has to be there, uh, how you choose that. The example shows that there are uh, things from algebraic topology which has, are involved there. But yes, for any R which is not a prime power, you can always do that. OK, so now. Do you use some homology theory in this? Uh, or uh, do you use some homology theory? Uh, or uh, is Actually, it the obstruction theory is involved. Yes, homology. Uh, theory is involved, obstruction theory is involved, and uh, uh, some good amount of even the idea of spectral sequences are involved. Oh. Actually, what happens that in these cases, you know, for example, in the, in the case of counterexample, if you have to prove that the theorem is not true, then some, counter, some uh, co uh, contradiction has to be obtained. And the whole idea is how to get the contradiction. 
So you assume that the theorem is true and then you build up the theory and finally you are able to show that uh, there's a contradiction if you assume that the theorem is true. That's the whole procedure. I will show that in the color version later on. Okay, so now having disposed of this uh, uh, topological Torberg theorem, now the question is, what would be the colored version of the topological Torberg theorem, colored version? Colored version means as follows. Now you see, this is actually quite, <clears throat> quite simple to understand, but actually it is very difficult. It turns out that it's, it's quite difficult. So this colored version was, uh, first of all, uh, studied by Barani, Furedi, and Loaz. Loaz, as you know, was a, is a great uh, person in working in graph theory and combinatorics. Uh, in the year 1990, they proved this result. And now see, this is such a simple result. Suppose we have 21 points in the plane, which are in general position. And seven of them are red, seven of them are blue, and seven of them are green. Now, you know that 21 points are given, then you can definitely by, Thorberg, by Brian Birch's theorem, you can decompose them into seven triangles so that the intersection of their converse is non-empty. But here now, the, the, what they want is that out of 27 point, 21 points, you have, there are seven which are of one color, seven are of different color, and the other seven are of third uh, different color. So you have red, blue, and green. And I want that you should have uh, seven triangles so that the vertices are all of different colors. So can you partition the 21 points uh, uh, in such a way that every triangle has three different colors, but these are of three different colors. So this is the result that they proved. And of course, proof again involved many very tricky things, but they proved this result given any 21 points uh, where seven are red, seven are blue, seven are green, you can always decompose them into seven uh, triangles. You can, you can call them rainbow triangles because vertices are of different colors so that the intersection of their convex hulls is not empty. But then this theorem was finally generalized in 1992 uh, by Barani and Larman, and they proved a, a, this general result uh, on the line of Brian Birch. Namely, they said that you take any three R points in plane in general position, where R are red, the second R are of blue color, and the third R of green color. Then you can find our disjoint triangles, each tri triangle having vertices of different colors, so that their intersection will be non empty. They proved this wonderful result. So this became the colored version of the, but actually it is not the colored version of the Torberg theorem, because in the Torberg theorem, you don't have three R points, you have three R minus two points in the plane. But this result was proved by Barani and Larman, and of course this attracted the attention of many people to work on the colored version in the, in the, in the most general form, not only in the case of plane, but go in the higher dimensional space R to the D. So what will be the color version there? And it was really, it turned out to be a very difficult problem. And uh, Barani and Larman, they posed the question. And the question is as follows. Actually, <clears throat> uh, the question is based upon many examples. First of all, they saw many examples and they, they said that perhaps this can be a color version of the uh, Torberg theorem in the most general form. So now remember those, those points are forgotten. Those, the, the D plus one times R minus D number of points are not there here. Uh, see, now N is changed now. He says that given any R, and uh, let n be d plus one times t. Now remember t is now replacing r, and suppose that d plus one times t is greater than or equal to d plus one times r. And uh, so take n number of points in r to the d, determine the smallest t such that if we take d plus one color classes of size less than or equal to t, we can find the family of r disjoint d simplices having vertices of different colors so that their intersection is non-empty. So actually here, what they did, that they took number of points more, because usually uh, the number of points is simply d plus one times r number of points in r to the d, but they said that let us take more number of points and let us take more number of color classes. 
and can we find out only our disjoint subsets in those more so some points will be left maybe some some points will be unaccounted for and some points uh, may not be uh, some some of the vertices may be of less color so given uh, so many points uh, having uh, t color classes uh, d plus 1 color classes and the size of every color class is less than equal to t so can you find out the smallest t so that we can find out the family of our disjoint bcps having vertices of different colors so that their intersection is non empty and they in fact they expected that this it can be proved that t is equal to r this is what they thought but it could not be proved it became a conjecture and many people started working on this so this was the question which was posed by barani and larman and then <coughs> if, uh, two people they uh, attacked this question and uh, uh, they are zvaljevic and rishika they introduced the concept of chessboard complexes in order to settle this problem colored version they introduced the concept of chessboard complexes they showed that when r is prime the above colored theorem holds when t is greater than or equal to 2 r minus 1 so the smallest value of t they showed is 2 r minus 1 they also indicated that the theorem is true when t is greater than or equal to 4 r minus 3 for any r greater than or equal to 2 due to uh, bertrand's postulate which states that there are there is a prime between r and 2 r the theorem of zvaljevic and virchika attracted a lot of attention but could not be considered very satisfactory for two reasons the, of course this is a colored theorem colored version of the thorberg theorem uh, but it was not found to be very satisfactory and there are two reasons as i pointed out earlier the first is that the from this colored version of the topological thorberg theorem you cannot you cannot the classical thorberg theorem does not appear as a special case and you will always like that the uh, thorberg theorem should appear as a special case of the colored theorem when uh, when the color classes consist of only single points so you have lots of color classes and then the, of course you don't have to worry about the color classes and so thorberg theorem uh, should be a special case of this uh, uh, color theorem so it was not that uh, it was not possible in this case so that was one drawback big drawback and the other thing is that several color points were left out unaccounted so it was a very good color theorem and the proofs were also very interesting but somehow the theorem was not uh, accepted to be satisfactory and uh, then uh, something wonderful happened yes in the year 9 2019 blagojevic maschke and ziegler ziegler as you know is a great man a very good mathematician they formulated when they gave a different formulation of the curl version of the topological thorberg theorem so they formulated a nice formulation of the theorem and proved a remarkable they called it new color topological thorberg theorem and uh, here is the statement of that theorem i think we have to go slow in order to appreciate this theorem so uh, let me read this theorem uh, carefully so uh, you take of course the same conditions on d that means it is greater than or equal to one dimensions euclid in space greater than or equal to one and the same r greater than or equal to two and suppose that this r is prime and remember these theorems are going to be true only when r is prime uh, they will also be true when r is prime power but otherwise they cannot be true because even the thorberg theorem is not true topological thorberg theorem is not true so consider the n simplex delta n now remember this is n the same n back which i pointed out d plus 1 times r minus 1 and if you add just one here in this n n plus 1 then this is the same thing same number which appears in the conjecture of brand bridge so consider the n simplex delta n whose vertices are colored into disjoint color classes c0 c1 c2 cm and where this number m is either equal to d plus 1 or more than d plus 1 that means you take more than or equal to d plus 1 color classes that means they take a n simplex 
and the vertices are colored and there are m color classes where m is greater than or equal to d plus one such that e for each i the size of every color class is at most r minus one the size should be less than r of every color class these are the conditions that they took and then it was really wonderful that they proved that then given any continuous map f from delta n to the r to the d there exists a family of r disjoint rainbow faces rainbow faces I, I have explained rainbow faces means all the vertices of that face they are of different colors so then given any continuous map f from delta n to the r to the d there exists a family of r disjoint rainbow faces sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma r of delta n such that the intersection of their f images is going to be non empty so this is the most important and uh, latest uh, colored topological torberg theorem which has been proved and it is very interesting to learn that they did not give one proof they gave three proofs of this theorem so here a face sigma i is said to be rainbow face if each vertex of sigma i is of different color which simply means that sigma i intersection with sigma j is less than equal to 1 for i less than or equal to r and j less than or equal to m and a rainbow face need not use all colors this is also important a rainbow face doesn't have to it can be smaller it doesn't have to use all the colors it can have only two colors three colors and so on that means a line segment having two uh, vertices of different colors or a triangle having three vertices and so on now the bmz theorem turns out to be very interesting topological torberg colored version of the topological torberg theorem because the classical torberg theorem becomes a special case of this theorem when the size of each color class is one and the all points of delta n are accounted for so actually the two defects uh, which were earlier in the uh, uh, zivaljevic and ricca colored version both defects were rectified in this colored version of the torberg theorem and actually you can you can see here here for example consider the n simplex whose vertices are colored into disjoint color classes c0 cm and so on now here suppose you have every color class is just a singleton so there will be will be as many color classes as there are vertices and uh, because the size is at most r minus 1 the size is 1 and therefore uh, you can see that this reduces to the Torberg theorem. Therefore, Torberg theorem becomes a special case of that theorem. And also, no point is uh, left out. Every point is accounted for. So this is the beauty of this theorem. OK, now I want to say a few words about, uh, <clears throat> about the chessboard complexes, because they are really a, a new idea was introduced. And they became very useful in proving not only this theorem, many other theorems also. So it's interesting to know them, what they are. These are ideas are very simple, but interesting. Consider just a illustration, consider a five plus five chess board. I have shown here two figures. This is one figure, this is one figure here. And they take rooks, as you know, the two rooks, they cannot be in one row, according to the rules of the chess. Uh, they can also not be in one column. So what you do, consider the placements of rooks in this uh, uh, five cross five chess board and uh, uh, make sure that no two rooks lie either in a row or in a column. So this, this we will call as a valid placement of rooks. So here's a valid placement of rooks. Here's another valid placement of rooks and so on. So think of all valid placements of rooks. And you can say, you can easily see that a subset of a valid placement of rooks is again a valid placement of rook. Therefore, you can easily see that the set of all valid placements of rooks in a five cross five chess board will form a simplicial complex. So we have got a simplicial complex and this is known as the chess board simplicial complex. 
a maximum of five rooks can be placed in the above chess board. A subset of valid placement of rooks is also valid placement. The set of all possible valid rook placements forms a simplicial complex. And the vertex is clearly a set of all squares and consists of 25 points. This is just an example. But then you can generalize this very easily. Consider a rectangular chess board having n cross k squares, m cross k squares, so that we get a simplicial complex which has m uh, times k vertices and whose simplices are all possible valid rook place, replacement, placements. Such a simplicial complex is known as the chessboard uh, complex and is denoted by delta mk. Of course, in this uh, theorem, uh, the uh, theorem that uh, the colored version, they, we needed only the square chessboard, not the general. But these chessboard complexes can be studied in their own right. One of the most interesting results about these simplicial complexes is that they are about their k connectedness property for suitable k. And uh, if you want to just see an example, so think of what is delta m1. So just only one line here. So this consists of m vertices and no other simplex. Therefore, it is a discrete set. Delta 3, 2, as you can easily see here, uh, you, that will consist of these. Uh, yeah, points. Professor Satyadev, you, you use the word cake. Uh, you use the word cake connected. Yes. Is that in the homotopy theory sense? Ha ah, ha, that's right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Of course, it, you know, there's a simplicial version also of that uh, in simplicial complex theory. So uh, here, of course, they will use that. But it is, yes, the general form is the homotopy connectedness. So uh, if you see this example, it turns out that this simplicial complex is simply the circle. This is a chessboard complex. And uh, you can easily see that delta 3, 2 is a subset of delta 3. So this is a subcomplex. And uh, this is simplicity isomorphic to this one. These are properties of the chessboard simplicial complexes. But the most interesting thing is the following. <clears throat> Consider this a special chessboard complex, namely delta R, delta R minus one. That means there are R rows and R minus one columns where R is a prime number. And visualize the simplicial complex with vertices as entries into this matrix form. A simplicial, a maximum simplex of this is shown as the entirely joined by lines such as a simplex has R minus one vertices. And it follows that this is a simplicial complex. And here is the interesting property. The chessboard complex delta R, R minus one is a connected R minus two dimensional orientable pseudo manifold. And the proof is not difficult. Just follow the definitions of the uh, connectedness and this chessboard complex. And you can easily prove that this is orientable. Just as you prove that the spheres are orientable or the triangulation of sphere is orientable. Similarly, you can also prove this. And also you can prove that this is a pseudo manifold. So this is a wonderful theorem, which is of course required. I'm, I will not go into the proof of these results. The proof is, of course, technical, but it is there. Okay, now then, of course, degree of an equivalent map. This is, of course, the equivalent theory you know, from coming from algebraic topology. And uh, uh, you think of sigma r minus one to be the r minus one simplex with vertices these one to r. The boundary of this uh, simplex is a triangulation of r minus two sphere s r minus two for every r greater than equal to two. Its simplices can be written in this form where i is omitted. i means it is omitted there. And we orient s r minus two by ordering them. The fundamental homology class of s r minus two is given by uh, this chain complex here. So since delta r r minus one is also a orientable pseudo manifold of dimension r minus two, we can write the orientation cycle of delta r r minus two also in this form. And here SR denotes the permutation group on our, our symbols. Define a map xi from delta r r minus one to boundary of r minus one simply by projecting the simplex this of delta r r minus one onto the simplex of this of the boundary of sigma r minus one. And uh, note that the group SR acts on delta R R minus simply by permuting the rows, whereas it acts on R by permuting the vertices. I mean, these are simple things which can be verified, actions of SR on these things. And with usual actions of SR, the map Xi is an SR map 
under this map, maximum simplicities go to the maximum simplicities of this. And uh, uh, what will be the inverse of this? It can be easily seen that the inverse is going to be in this form where this is omitted. And the number is clearly R minus one factorial. And therefore one can compute the degree and I'm going to just state the result. Uh, if xi denotes the projection map from this to that, uh, then the degree of this comes out to be R minus one factorial. This is a very important result. And why I'm doing this actually, I am doing this to uh, simply because this is one idea. One idea is that of the chessboard complexes and the other idea is the degree of an equivalent map. And these two ideas are used very heavily in the proof of the uh, colored version of the topological turbulence. I don't think I have much time, but I just want to say the following. Here, there's a result um, about the degree of equivalent map. Suppose M is a triangulated compact orientable n-dimensional pseudo manifold, and suppose G is a finite group acting freely and simplicially on M. Suppose SW is G invariant sphere on, in a real n plus one dimensional G representation of W, and suppose S and M both have the same orientation character. That is to say, each element of G either preserves the orientation of both M and S or reverses the orientation. Then for any two G maps, F and G, this result holds. Degree of F is the same thing as degree of G modulo modulus of G. This is a very well-known result. And then here is the map. If you think of that map H that we uh, produced earlier, then we prove that degree of H is either plus one or minus one modulus R. The whole thing is that degree of H is not equal to zero. And this is what will be used in the proof of that here. So maybe I'm not going to give the proof, but here is just an idea. My time is over. So BMZ, as I said, gave three different proofs of their theorem. One of the proofs uses the obstruction theory of algebraic topology, and the other uses the concept of ideal theoretic G index theory. And the third one is this, which uses the degree concept and the chessboard complexes. There's a lemma, of course, which simpl simplifies the whole proof. And uh, then, uh, then the whole idea is this. Suppose they uh, take the statement of the colored version of the uh, topological turbo theorem, and suppose it is not true and then go on building up uh, the necessary uh, tools. And uh, finally, you arrive at a contradiction. And the contradiction is that this degree that I showed here, some equivalent map occurs there. And it turns out the degree is, if, if you assume the, that the theorem is, uh, if you assume that the contradiction theorem is not true, then the degree turns out to be zero. In other words, you get a contradiction. And that actually completes the whole proof. So. I will just skip all these things and finish my talk. These are all the references if somebody needs. So I think I will close here. Um, <clears throat> the proof can be found actually the paper has already appeared and the, these are references. They're very interesting to read all the three proofs. So thank you very much. Now, Professor Kulkarni, you asked me a question. Uh, I am again, uh, uh, I have to modify my answer. Uh, they produced uh, that you take an R which is not a prime power, they produced an example. Not that every R which is not a prime power, I, I am not sure about that. Now I remember perhaps that may not be the case. They produced an example of a R which is not a prime power so that the theorem is not true. Your question was that given any R, which is not a prime power, you do have an example. Uh, I am not sure really. I thought perhaps, yes, but I am not sure. So I will check you and maybe tell you later on. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Professor Satyadev. Any question, any other question or comment? Professor Kulkarni, please, please unmute, please unmute. So this just seems to be like the finding some applications of 
algebraic topology, higher homotopy theory, higher homology theory, uh, and also using some arithmetic. <laughs> yes, yes. Like the, like the P.S. Smith theory. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. Yes. And it uh, yeah reminds me of this Nielsen's problem in surface theory. Uh -huh. Uh, the uh, given a finite group G, then it's acting on the Teichmuller space, mm -hmm. uh, and using the P.S. Smith theory and the fact that Teichmuller space was totally contractible, uh, they could prove it for uh, uh, for the for the prime power groups. Uh -huh. But then you needed some more geometric ideas to do it, to prove it for arbitrary groups. Uh -huh. But it avoided the specific group structure. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that was, uh, uh, I guess it was Thurston and some of his students, that was the remarkable application in that setup. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So here you are, yeah, you're generalizing even that in some ways. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, I got interested simply because I, I had, I was familiar with obstruction theory and also the G yeah. index theory. And I found that it's really a beautiful application. Of course, the problem was to formulate and yeah. prove the colored version of the general term. That was the problem. And incidentally, it so happened that the algebraic topology became their uh, savior. I mean, algebraic topology became their uh, main tool to prove this theorem. People are trying to simplify, but no other proof has come out so far. Three proofs they gave. Yes. And Loaz had come to Hyderabad, you remember? Just before coming, he proved, he had proved this theorem. Yes. Yes. Any other question? Okay, thank you, Professor Satyadev, for very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Okay.